Okay, so we just talked about friction drag, which is a peculiar form of drag that really only applies to flat plates. Let's talk now more generally about drag. So drag is usually dominated by pressure forces. Shear stress usually plays a, a smaller role in the total drag force. And if you look at the figure below, you can see um, as air flows around a car, the shape of the car has a big impact on the flow field that develops around the car. And that in turn um, causes a strange pressure distribution around that car. That pressure distribution is what determines the drag. So you can see the drag is, is greatly affected by the shape of the object, uh, uh, among other things. You can tell the pressure distribution around the car is would be difficult to predict. Um, it typically needs to be measured directly or on scale models. Uh, we looked before at how if you know the pressure distribution around an object, you can perform an integration and calculate the drag. But it doesn't make any, make any sense to go to the effort of determining the complete pressure distribution. If you're that concerned with the drag, you would measure it directly or in a wind tunnel with a scale, with a, with a model object. And um, the technology is now out there to do fluid dynamic simulation models um, with computers that uh, can get pretty good numbers on drag force. But that's, that's beyond the scope of this class, but just so you know it's out there. So... For the most case, we're stuck with wind tunnels or computational models, but for simple objects, they can be looked up on tables. And your book has a bunch of tables for those. So drag, this is that same equation we saw. Drag is a function of the coefficient of drag. And this is usually the hardest thing to determine. It, it incorporates a lot of complicated things in this single dimensionless number. We'll spend most of our time just talking about that. Density is obvious. U, again, is the velocity of the fluid relative to the object. And area is the characteristic area. With a flat plate, it was obvious what area we were talking about. With a three-dimensional object, it's not so obvious. What's typically used is a projection, or the area of the shadow that the object would create. So we don't use the actual surface area of the object. There's two projections that are typically used. Um, a frontal area is commonly used. So for a plane, for example, if you were to calculate the drag force on the plane, you would probably want to use the shadow projected by the object as if you're looking straight at it. So that the area of that flat shadow that I've shown there. Plan form area is often used as well. This is typically used with boats. So this is the downward projection. So the shape of that submerged portion of the object as you look downward. And then finally, the power need to be that needs to be exerted to overcome drag is the drag force times V, which which we go back to our original velocity. That's the velocity of the object relative to the ground, regardless of how fast the fluid is flowing. And this is kind of strange, because to calculate drag, we use the velocity of the fluid relative to the object. But to calculate power, we use the velocity of the object relative to the ground. So these are two different velocities. And the reason for this is, you have to go back to your physics textbook when you defined work. If you remember, work wasn't just energy, it was, it was useful energy. So, and, and that's why we, this, we use this velocity here for power, because we want to describe just useful power. Um, a plane in a wind tunnel that isn't moving forward, that isn't doing anything useful, um, does not exert power based on how we've defined work. So you, you have to have a forward motion to exert power. OK, so your book has a number of tables where we can look up coefficient of drag values. Here's one for basic uh, 
extruded two-dimensional shapes. And you'll notice that they list a Reynolds number where this was determined. They also define the reference area or the characteristic area very specifically. So anytime you use a table like this for coefficient of drag, make sure you also find out what area you're supposed to use corresponding to that number. And notice some of the shapes have direction. So uh, a semicircular cylinder has a different drag whether you're hitting the rounded end or hitting the flat end. Here's another table in your textbook with three-dimensional objects. Again, make sure you use the proper reference area. There it has a range of Reynolds numbers over which it's applicable. Look at the stream, streamlined object. See how low that is compared to the other coefficients of drag? Streamlining has a big impact on drag forces, and we'll talk about that later. And then here's some other three-dimensional objects, trees and cars and trucks and trains and things. Um, notice the bikers. Look at the drop you get by drafting in your coefficient of drag from 0.88 to 0.5. It's a pretty big drop in drag. Um, and then also notice the dolphin. Look at how ridiculously low that coefficient of drag is. It, it is approaching the same drag as a flat plate, which is pretty amazing. And then finally, there's this figure. Anytime you have a sphere or a cylinder, you can use this figure, uh, which gives you the coefficient of drag over a large range of Reynolds numbers. So this is very useful. Incidentally, we'll, we'll see this figure again in the next lecture, and we'll spend a lot of time looking at the different regions of it and why you see this coefficient of drag change. Okay, so let's do an example. Let's find the power required to ride a bicycle at 20 miles per hour in a headwind and with a tailwind. So two different cases. To calculate power, we need to know drag. So we're going to use the drag equation first. Um, let's look up for a bicycle. I'm going to use a racing bicycle. So that gives me a coefficient of drag of 0.88, an area of 3.9. Um, and I can look up the density for air, which is typically around this. So the next thing I need is that velocity. So I need the velocity of the fluid relative to the object. And this can get tricky, so you have to do this part carefully. So the bicycle is traveling at 20 miles per hour. That's relative to the ground in a 10 mile per hour headwind. So that means that the air traveling past the bike is 30 miles per hour. Same kind of logic, if you're going 20 miles per hour and wind is blowing behind you at 10 miles per hour, then your U is only 10 miles per hour. And then I converted those to feet per second, a more useful unit. And now I've got everything I need. I can just plug those in. And you can see the drag force in a headwind is 7.9, where with a tailwind it's 0.9. So if you've ridden a bicycle in the wind before, you know right off the bat wind makes a huge difference as you're trying to propel yourself forward. And you can see the drag is almost 10 times higher when you're traveling into the wind rather than with the wind at your back. Power is that drag force times the forward velocity. So it's 20 miles per hour. We convert that to feet per second, and that's simple to calculate. Power in our headwind when you're traveling into a headwind is, again, almost 10 times as high as it is when you're traveling with a tailwind. Now, for more complex objects, I said you should really use um, measure it directly or with a scale model in a wind tunnel or if you're sophisticated, use a, um, a simulation model. But there's a third option. You can um, also approximate complex objects by summing up simpler objects. So let's look at this antenna, which is a series of columns. So it's three different size columns all linked together. We have a certain uh, wind velocity which we're using. 
Again, I can look up viscosities and densities for air under typical conditions. So the drag force on the antenna is just, a sum, is just the, is approximately equal to the sum of the drag on each of those columns. I can factor out the density and the velocity since they're the same for all the cylinders. And now it's just a matter of determining the coefficient of drag. So I'm going to start by calculating the Reynolds number. Um, notice in the Reynolds number for x, I use the diameter of the column. That's my characteristic length for columns. And I get 76,000 for the big one. The medium size one is half as big and the smallest one is half as big again. So now I can go to my figure. I can look up those Reynolds numbers. I have 7.6 times 10 to the fourth, 3.8 times 10 to the fourth, 1.9 times 10 to the fourth. I go past, see where it crosses the smooth cylinder, and they all cross at pretty much the same place. So I end up with a coefficient of drag of 1.5 for all three of the columns. So even though they have slightly different Reynolds numbers, it just happens to turn out that the coefficient of drags are the same. OK, the last thing I need is the areas. Um, again, we use the projected area. So it's the rectangle created by that cylinder. It's just the length times the diameter. So we don't use pi r squared. We don't use 2 pi r. We just use the rectangle that that shadow creates. And we can do that for the three different cylinders. Notice there's four sections of the third one, so it's times four. And then I'm going to factor the coefficient of drag out of the drag equation because it's the same for all three. And my drag equation resolves to this, and I get a total drag of 192 newtons. Now again, it's important to remember what, when you do these composite objects, this is an approximation. There's going to be strange things happening at all the joints, and uh, the, the different sections may interact with each other, causing um, larger changes in the pressure distribution around the object. So it's just an approximation. If you needed a good number, you'd have to measure it directly or do a simulation.